It is 2.11 p.m. in Salem, Alabama. Vicki Braswell and six other family members hear the dreaded sound of the local tornado siren. But this wasn't just any tornado warning. This was a tornado emergency. To their west, an already lethal, half-mile-wide vortex is barreling towards them at 60 miles per hour. Hunkered in the middle of her manufactured home, they all brace for what came next. Sunday, March 3rd, 2019. Even for winter, the first two months of the year was noticeably quiet to start the tornado season. This theme was a carryover from 2018, as the United States was going on nearly two years without a violent tornado, a tornado rated a 4 or 5 on the enhanced Fujita scale. In these first days of March 2019, the entire continental United States was awash with very strong westerly flow. A deepening upper low over Canada created a speed maxima over the southeastern United States. This prompted rising motion, creating a surface low to form over Louisiana and drift east. Moist gulf air evected northward towards the low. The Storm Prediction Center outlined an enhanced risk for severe weather. The primary concern at the time was for damaging linear winds as the cold front provided the main forcing. However, a conditional tornadic supercell threat seemed to exist in the warm sector. Extremely favorable wind shear could compensate where buoyancy was maximized. The reality of risk grew more evident in the late morning, with Tornado Watch issuance across much of southern Alabama. Further mesoscale discussions from the SPC foreshadowed an extremely narrow corridor along the Alabama-Georgia border, where strong and efficient low-level directional wind shear would establish. A forecast like this one requires constant updates as conditions evolve. For the few storm chasers out this day, Mobile internet is a crucial tool in the toolbox to have the most up-to-date weather information possible. In rural parts of the country, it can sometimes be difficult to find reliable data connection, which is where today's video sponsor, Saley, comes in. As a storm chaser myself, I've chased in some of the most remote areas of the United States and even abroad to document the skies. Saley is an eSIM that makes it extremely easy to get mobile internet plans. I just downloaded their app, picked the plan I needed, and boom, I've got internet covered before I even depart for my destination. From tracking aurora conditions in remote Iceland, hurricane progress in the Yucatan of Mexico, or even places in rural America where my normal carrier has no coverage, Saley has affordable mobile internet plans for almost anywhere in the world that'll keep you from getting hit with costly unexpected roaming fees. Downloading the Saley app is way more convenient than waiting in line at the airport to buy a foreign SIM card. Going to more than one country on a trip? Saley has you covered there as well with packages that cover all of Europe or even the Caribbean. The convenience, affordability, and user support makes this the mobile internet solution for your travels. June 1st viewers that download the Saley app are getting a 15% discount when they use code June 1st when buying their first mobile internet plan of choice. Use my link saley.com slash June 1st or scan the QR code to get your mobile internet plan for your next travel venture or even storm chase. Again, that's saley.com slash June 1st or scan the QR code on the screen now. Thank you to Saley for sponsoring this video. A group of merging cells ahead of the cold front rocketed northeast towards Montgomery. The prevailing cell collided into the warm front positioned along I-85, turning it on an easterly course. This warm front both maximized vorticity being ingested and increased the storm relative inflow, a perfect one-two punch to turn this supercell tornadic. Warning coordinators at the National Weather Service office in Birmingham were already on the case, issuing tornado warnings well ahead of the storm. On the hour at 2 p.m. local time, the tornado touched down off of Rogers Road northwest of Society Hill, Alabama. Almost immediately, the circulation was over a quarter mile wide. Damage was confined to trees and power poles, but it wouldn't stay that way. At the warning desk at the Birmingham WFO, their dual polarized radar products confirmed a large tornado on the ground at 2.04 p.m. With signs of only strengthening, criteria was met to issue a tornado emergency, the highest level of tornado warning. Concurrently, the tornado overtakes Lee County Road 36. On the west side of the road, a manufactured home was picked up and thrown some 50 yards, claiming two of the three occupants' lives. Across the street, 
An unanchored single-family home had everything above ground scattered into an opposing tree line, including an occupant who'd also lose their life. After crossing a small pond, the tornado took aim at several homes along County Road 39. On this road are the homes of the Stensons, Robinsons, and Joneses. This group shared family ties through blood and marriages. The tornado went on to inflict some of the most catastrophic damage along this stretch, where a well-built home was reduced to rubble and several manufactured homes were windrowed into the adjacent woods. In this quarter-mile stretch of Lee County Road 39, multiple lives were claimed in a matter of seconds. The tornado emergency push notification alerts rippled downstream of the nearly mile-wide vortex. More manufactured homes were picked up from their weak foundations and thrown into debarked southern pines. On an offshoot of the parkway was the home of Marshall Lynn Grimes. Grimes is there with his partner, Sheila Creech, his daughter, 11-year-old Kayla, and her friend, Taylor Thornton. The manufactured home, like many others before it, stood no chance against the violent tornado. In the process, Grimes, Creech, and Thornton would perish. Marshall Lynn Grimes was an avid motorcyclist and a devout man of faith. Sheila Creech, a survivor of Category 5 Hurricane Michael in Panama City, Florida, rekindled her relationship with Grimes in the aftermath. Taylor Thornton was described as a ray of sunshine who could make friends with anybody. The tornado moved eastward, leaving 11-year-old Kayla Grimes in the debris, gravely injured as the sole survivor. The storm tracked over more rural areas for the next couple miles, impacting the occasional residents before crossing into the southern edge of Salem, Alabama. Sirens wailed in town, which could be heard by Vicki Braswell and the six other occupants in her home. The company hunkered in the middle of the mobile home, doing their best to stay low. This did not matter to the tornado, as this manufactured home was picked up and entirely thrown onto its roof. Next door, another mobile home succumbs to the tornado in a similar fashion, its deck and above ground pool still standing. Towards the border is the city of Smith Station, a growing suburb of the Columbus, Georgia metro. The community was a part of the original tornado emergency issued 17 minutes prior when the tornado bore down on the city. On radar, a mile wide debris ball paints a bleak picture for what is about to come. The tornado cuts north of downtown, where numerous neighborhoods lay. Fortunately for much of Smith Station, the tornado had lost some of its steam. Despite the wide wind field, damage is limited mostly to roofs for the majority of homes. Weaker structures near the core were the hardest hit. The tornado would leave Smith Station to the northeast, crossing Lake Oliver into the state of Georgia. Warning responsibilities now fell on the NWS office in Atlanta, who already had issued their own tornado emergency right before entering Smith Station. While Smith Station was getting hit by the violent long tracker, an embedded supercell to the west was spooling up seemingly in line with what had already been mowed over. Western Lee County found themselves under yet another tornado warning in less than an hour for a completely different storm. At 2.27 p.m., this new supercell planted a tornado five miles south of Tuskegee, Alabama. It tracked northeast towards the devastated areas of Lee County. Back over in Georgia, the still ongoing original tornado cut through the rural areas north of the Columbus suburbs. Occasional homes would be subjected to the full force of the tornado, suffering similar fates to those of Lee County. The embedded supercell to the west drew in on Lee County with NWS Birmingham confirming yet another damaging tornado on radar. With estimated peak winds of 115 miles per hour, this three quarter mile wide tornado comes within an eighth of a mile of the original tornado's track. For the next 12 miles, this second tornado carved a parallel track of destruction, disrupting the rescue efforts as first responders had to find shelter themselves. Among the first responders in the chaos is the neighbor of Vicki Braswell. Armed with a chainsaw, he'd cut his way into the flipped structure and freed the seven inside. Vicki was the most injured. Despite life-saving efforts from the neighbor, she would pass. Vicki Braswell was described as an avid reader and a sweet soul. The original tornado was still ongoing over in Georgia. It struck the small town of Talbotton, where more homes would be reduced to slabs of concrete. 
Finally, after 76 minutes of terror, the tornado occluded in the rural woods 10 miles east of town. Back in Lee County, 11-year-old Kayla Grimes is fighting for her life. It had been 45 minutes since the tornado, where she still remained in the debris of what was once her home. She'd be rescued by first responders, where the extent of her injuries would be uncovered. Multiple bones were broken in each of her legs, her right wrist fractured, spleen ruptured, bruised lungs, and even an injury to her eye. It was a miracle that she survived. Other first responders upstream from the Grimes household reached the hardest hit areas at the intersection of Lee County Roads 36 and 39. It is quickly realized this is a mass casualty situation. In a devastating discovery, 10 of them found were relatives in one form or another with ages ranging from 38 to 89 years old. As searches ran through the night and into the next day, the total loss of life in Lee County, Alabama climbed to 23, making this the most lethal U.S. tornado since the Moore EF-5 in 2013. Another 90 sustained serious injuries requiring treatment. Immediately following the event, the National Weather Service offices of Birmingham and Atlanta conducted damage surveys. Across the two forecast office coverage areas, a 68-mile continuous path was carved at a peak width just shy of a mile wide. This tornado earned an EF4 rating with max estimated winds of 170 miles per hour. The longest period without a violent tornado in U.S. weather history ended at 22 months. The most alarming aspect of the survey was the number of fatalities and injuries associated with weakly built manufactured homes. A further study into the tornado found that 19 of the 23 fatalities were those sheltered in a manufactured home, with some of those structures less than 15 years old. In multiple instances, porches were essentially untouched while the homes themselves were completely destroyed. The root cause of these mobile home structure failures was due to a lack of adequate retention to foundations and their overall inherently weak construction. Beyond the two tornadoes that struck Lee County, an entire outbreak of tornadoes unfolded across the states of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Of the 44 confirmed touchdowns, nine were rated EF2 or greater on this enhanced risk day. As for the victims, recovery was slow for many including 11-year-old Kayla Grimes. After a half dozen surgeries and many more hours of physical therapy, she'd go on to make a full recovery, with her fighting spirit being a part of the bright light for the residents of Lee County, Alabama. This tornado's anniversary would be overshadowed exactly a year later, when Nashville and Cookville, Tennessee would see their own tragic tornadoes. As world events spiraled from there, and the Mayfield tornado disaster took place in 2021, the Lee County EF4 became overlooked, though its lessons on the dangers of sheltering in mobile homes are still very relevant today.